Hello, everyone. Today it's February 12, 2015, and this is the week in charts. I know I say this every week, but this week I really mean it. I'm going to get a little jacked up on some Mountain Dew. I got a little overzealous and accidentally opened up my can of Mountain Dew before the show. Um, so you just have to imagine a sound. Oh, good stuff. Anyway, I've got a lot to cover, so I'll get jacked up on the Dew. Um, makers of Mountain Dew do not compensate me for that endorsement. But hey, PepsiCo, you out there? Give me a shout out. I don't want to spend too much time on that nonsense. Um, we do have a sponsor, FinancialJuice.com. You like it, the juice? The juice is good. www.financialjuice.com slash Dave Lander if you want to follow me there. Um, we're in the early phases of um, planning uh, and uh, this uh, my trip coming up here is kind of putting a wrench into things. But uh, within a month or so, you'll probably see some more and more stuff from me over at Financial Juice. So keep an eye out uh, for for that. And I have some, some um, additional shows in the works, which um, we'll, we'll probably find their way there, too. Uh, there's a disclaimer screen. Let me just sum it up. All predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Hey, do me a favor. Throw me a bone. You read the book? You like it, the book? Put me up a review on Amazon. Dot com. I don't want to spend too much time on this because we have a lot to cover, but one reason, other than the obvious reasons, but one of the reasons that I ask for reviews is that there are a lot of malignant people out there that do stupid things like review the reviews, and I can't imagine having that much time. So a good review, provided, of course, it's honest, obviously, uh, helps to uh, counteract that. I get a lot of people... Uh, send me these big accolades about the book and, and thanking me. And I'm like, well, thank you, but could you put that up on Amazon <laughs> if that's how you truly feel? Anyway, uh, okay, what do we talk about? Well, we'll get a quick announcement real quick. Uh, no show. Next week the World Tour kicks off, and my first stop is going to be Bologna, Italy. Um, and then when I get back, this will be a pretty busy week upon return. So if you want to catch up on webinars then, I'm going to have um, – a webinar for, I think it's Investor Inspiration uh, is, is the following week. We'll do another week of charts. And then I'm also doing a panel host for uh, TimingResearch.com. So just see the, count, see the countdowns on my website for more info. The countdown for the uh, Investor Inspiration webinar won't be up until I return, but it'll be later in the week, maybe on Wednesday, I think, of that week. There's a, there's a webinar in between if I put it up now. It'll go to the wrong webinar. But um, should we go along the Euro? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> um, for, it's going to be nice to go over there for a change where the Euro is not uh, not two to one. Um, I got an email from a service subscriber, and he wanted to know why I seem to be so bullish on the energies. I don't know if I'm so bullish on the energies. But I do think they are constructive, and I do think that we have a possible bottom in the works. And I'm going to talk about that quite a bit. Um, yesterday, while I was working on my slides for my Italy visit, I stumbled across a presentation I did about trading efficient markets for Forex. And I got to thinking, you know, especially since there's so much going on, this would be a good time to give that speech again, and I don't remember who I did it for, but it was for um, a third party. It wasn't something I did, I don't think, in the week of charts. And it's very relevant with the oil market bottoming, maybe gold's bottoming in here to a lesser extent at least because it's kind of taking its own sweet time. So I figured now would be a good time to talk about that. So I was going to give that presentation on that today. Okay, let me um, – Hang on one second. I can take care of something real quick. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, I got this email. It's hi, Dave. I am trying to understand what you see in the oil slash energies that makes you bullish on USO. Looking at the chart attached, it appears that the oils have made a similar consolidation at new lows that preceded its last sharp move down. What is different this time? Is there a section of your book I should review on this? Well, the section of the book you should review would be the trend transitional, the emerging trend stuff towards the second half of Labus. Now, let's talk about your question or the other parts of your question. 
Okay. This is the chart that he sent me. And his name is John. Did I put that in here? Yeah, John. Okay, this is the chart that John sent me. And he was saying that, okay, well, you had this pattern here where it made like these three higher lows. And then the market imploded. And then, once again, it makes sort of the three higher lows in somewhat of a similar fashion. Now, now, truth be told, back here, this market was in a pretty serious slide. And when it started doing this number here, I began to think, well, wait a minute. Maybe this market is bottoming out because it was going down and now it's sort of going sideways. So maybe it's bottoming out. But you don't just buy because the market is, does this. You don't buy at the bottom of the L. You wait for the market to begin to show signs of turning. Now, before we pick apart this too much, let's talk about a couple of things when you observe something in the market. So John made an observation where market goes sideways, makes these three higher lows, and then it goes sideways again and makes these three higher lows. So what's different this time? Why should it not drop like last time? Well, when you start making observations about the market, you got to be very careful not to make an observation in a vacuum, so to speak. You, you have to make sure that if you think you might have found some sort of thing empirically by looking at the markets, like a three higher low pattern leads to lower lows, whatever the case may be, like John had pointed out. You got to ask yourself, is it just one observation? Okay? And then what I would recommend you do is find at least a hundred similar observations, and you just might have something. Now, the reason I say you just might have something is because you also need to put some logic behind it. Now, I have in discovering patterns, my patterns, and a lot of stuff that I do is not rocket science and not necessarily earth shattering, and I didn't reinvent the wheel. I'm sorry, I didn't um, invent the wheel. A lot of my stuff is similar to patterns prior. Like someone once said, that pullback thing you invented put my daughter through college. Well, that was back in the late 90s. And I thanked the gentleman, but I tried to explain to him that I did not invent the pullback. I just have embraced it and through empirical research have really come to like it. So what you need to do is you need to figure out what's the logic behind that. For instance, when I'm looking at a pattern like the gatekeeper, the logic behind it is that the market is stalling short of its prior highs and the people are being faked out thinking that it's going to go to its old highs, back to its old highs. And there's other people that, or, uh, well, yeah, they're just assuming that it's going to go back on to its old highs. Now, let me give you a better example before I get too tripped up in that. Uh, a trend knockout is a much better example of something that's conceptually correct. I, I picked my most complex pattern to try to explain, and that didn't work. But a trend knockout makes a lot of sense because if you have a market that's rallying, and let's say it's at a really, really nice trend, and all of a sudden, bam, it makes this knockout move. Well, that's going to do two things. That's going to knock out people that were long. Let's say you got a little trailing stop it here. You get knocked out. Okay. So be it. Whatever. And it's also going to attract eager shorts. Okay. Who want to sell this market or have already sold it or tried to pick a top. Now, when this market goes back up, you're able to capitalize on the predicament of these traders. So logically, it makes some sense. Years ago, Larry Connors taught me the concept conceptually correct when I used to work with him doing some uh, consulting research on a mechanical basis back in the days when I used to program, do a lot of programming when I first got really serious into the markets and early in my uh, full-time professional career. 
Uh, so again, a trend knockout is conceptually correct in that it knocks the people out of the trend, and it also sucks the people in. And when the market resumes, or if the market resumes, then you, you're able to capitalize on the predic predicament of these traders. The shorts are forced to buy, and those that were knocked out are forced to buy back in or risk being left behind. So again, when you think you've got something new, Make sure it's not just one observation. Find at least 100 observations. And then you might have something, provided, of course, it's also conceptually correct. Now, there's a form of technical analysis that I, that I would not, I personally don't consider really technical analysis. I guess technically it is, but I don't see how it works. Let me rephrase that. I made the mistake when I was in Russia of saying, I don't get it, I'm talking about GAN, and some guy ripped me a new one. Um, what I mean by I don't get it is I don't think it works, okay? So an analog is when you look at a prior chart pattern, okay? Let's say the market did this in 1929, did this. And then it did that, okay? Probably looks more like this, 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 and then that. All right, but anyway. So let's say you see a market doing this out here in 2000 and whatever, okay? You're like, aha, this is just like it looked in 1929. This peak's a little bit lower, but anyway, you get the idea. Let's just start over on that. Let's say you see a market looks like this. Okay, and then all of a sudden you see a market in the future looks like this. Well, you automatically assume that you could take this and slide it over, and then you'll have, you know, dot, 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 that. I see this done quite often. That's called an analog. And it really makes for a very interesting type of analysis because it's, it's just cool it just looks neat okay but I've yet to see it really work and I think if it does work I think it becomes more of an aberration than anything okay now I'm not saying that you can't go in and study markets historically to learn about them in the future if you go back to 1929 we had bow ties sell signals on things of that nature. We had patterns like that. We had a big pullback, a retracement type of pattern. So there were, they are reoccurring patterns, but just be careful taking like a, a big chunk of the chart and trying to broadcast that forward, okay? I think it makes for great newsletter writing. I think it makes for like a, oh, geez, golly whiz type of thing. But I don't think it's an actionable and tradable signal. So I don't want to beat up on those people who do that. There are some respectable people out there that do occasionally talk about analogs. I'm not saying that they are uh, disingenuous at doing that, but I think it's very hard to make an actionable signal out of an analog like that. Okay. Now, it's true that he who ignores history is damned to repeat it, but it never unfolds in the same way. So you've got this perfect little analog pattern, and it's more than just this right here, okay? It'd be something like much bigger picture type of pattern, and you get the same thing that occurs over here. You overlay the two charts, and you automatically assume it's going to do the same thing again. But you've got to realize that it never quite unfolds the same way things change. And and true, maybe it will maybe it will eventually go down based on the analog, but eventually it could be a long time. And by the time it does go down, your analogs no longer line up. Okay? So it's kinda like uh for some reason I'm thinking plot your curves and then and then uh how's the old saying go? Plot your curves first and then and then draw your indicate then uh do your equations. But again, things change. So remember that today's action might look eerily like those of yesterday's 
but things have changed since then. It's different. You're dealing with different markets and different situations. Now, so the question is, why am I bullish and what's different? Well, this is my chart, and this is the, what he pointed out. You got these three higher peaks here, and then you got these three higher peaks here. And then right here, it imploded. So the question is, right here, it's going to implode, right? Well, it might. I mean, market can do whatever it freaking wants, as we all know. If you've been trading for more than a couple of days, or more than a day, I should say, or more than an hour, you probably learned that, okay? Now, what am I seeing now that I didn't see then, I guess, is the big, is a $64,000 question. Well, you had a bit of a rage here, okay? Depends on how you want to draw it. And then we did see some improvement here. And then we've got somewhat of a range here, and then we did see some improvement here. Okay, so that looks somewhat the same, but also notice what's going on with these moving averages. Okay, this is, these are the bow tie moving average, 10 simple, 20 exponential, and 30 exponential. This is 10 down here, this is the 20, and this is the 30. So they're in downtrend proper order, meaning that 10 is less than the 20 is less than the 30. Okay, but notice what's beginning to happen here. They're beginning to come together, okay, and it's kind of a sloppy bow tie, but it's a bow tie nonetheless. Now, what do you mean by sloppy bow tie, Dave? Well, notice back here, it's a very beautiful, almost textbook type of bow tie, okay, and by the way, for those keeping score, you had back-to-back -back bow ties in the energies, a bit of a double top, and then what happened? Well, we had the mother of all downtrend. So not to digress too far, but when you combine this classical technical analysis with back-to-back -back signals, sometimes it's called the second mouse signal, second mouse, early bird, early bird might get the worm, but the second mouse gets the cheese, okay, sometimes. And you also had a first thrust back here for those keeping score. So yeah, it did look like things were improving quite a bit right here, and I'll have to go back and look. I didn't think about it. But you can go back in and watch my market commentary uh, on my trading service for this day. It's behind a firewall, but um, I'll get it public if you want it. And I might have said, hey, we're kind of bullish on these energies, but let's look what happened, okay? Notice that they never did trigger. They just dropped and dropped and dropped, okay? You're, you got a high, and then you got lower highs, and then what happens? They begin to implode, okay? But again, now you got a little gap here, so it's trying to it's trying to work its way higher, and now you got a little bit of a of a pullback. Okay. Now, truth be told, this isn't the most beautiful bottoming pattern in the world, but it's like the market has stopped going down at least for now. It has gone mostly sideways for a couple of months, and then the moving averages are beginning to turn up. So, as a general statement, it's improving now we'll have to see if it's going to materialize. Now, I'm going to probably say this quite a bit, but I'll say it now. Keep in mind with emerging trend patterns, and this is going to be quite obvious in just a few minutes, but with emerging trend patterns, you're looking at the little blue arrow over here, and you're fighting the big blue arrow over here, okay? And in this particular case, even we never did have a signal, to, so to speak, but it was bottoming by going sideways and then a little bit up right here. But then it began to implode again. So the big blue arrow wins here. Okay. But maybe now's the time for this market to finally bottom out. Now keep in mind that when you're trading the little blue arrow, I know they're red on this chart, but they used to be blue when I first started, when I first fired up my paint program 15 years ago to, uh, to write a column. So that's where that came from, and that's why I named my production company BigBlueArrowProductions.com. Anyway, but keep in mind you are fighting that longer-term trend, so we'll talk about that in just one second. Now, so why do I like the energies? Keep in mind with transitional patterns or emerging trend patterns, more often than not, they're going to show up in the individual issues. And 2007, in October 2007, there were some sectors that were still making new highs. Well, heck, the overall market was still making new highs. 
And what happened? We begin to get cell signals. I actually, and I said this in nausea, I'll say it again. I actually apologize to my clients, guys and gals. Markets making new highs. I just can't find any setups to save my life except for these shorts, these transitional sell short patterns. So let's just take a stab at the short side. And I began seeing more and more of that unfold. So if a market's going to turn, it's a lot easier for that sector to turn, I'm sorry, for that individual issue to turn first and then the sector to catch up with it, okay? Now, take a look at this possible trade here. This is actual setup for today, okay? You're asking what symbol it is. Um, well, I'm going to let it trigger, and then I'll tell you what's, I'll tell you in two weeks what signal, what symbol it was, okay? And if you sign up for the service after this webinar, I'll tell you as soon as you sign up. <laughs> How's that for a tease? But notice, what do we have working here? Notice these moving averages, okay? 10, less than 20, less than 30. And also notice it did kind of consolidate a little bit in here like energies overall, but then what happened? It continued to implode. And notice that these moving averages never even came close to touching a crossing, okay? Now let's look what happened. We made an all-time low here, or a major all-time low. We came down and retested it. So now what do we have? We got a double bottom, okay? For those with a good eye, you'll probably notice that we also have what? A cup and handle, okay? And to those who are trained in Big Dave Landry style, we have a bow tie. So you got a bow tie off of major double bottoms. This is a very powerful signal. This might be the mother of all bottoms. And the beauty of this is, I wish I had the, the I, I didn't put the numbers on here because you guys have figured it out. Y'all have done that to me before, so now I can't put the numbers on here when I'm talking about current setups. Because <laughs> y'all smart, and I'm impressed. But I forget what this is, but I think it's, uh, let's just say it's at least two times more. So I think this market has a potential to rally this much at least. I think it has a potential to go up 100%. Okay, I'll, I'll get to that uh, question, Wilfred. That's a good. That's a good question. So I think this market has a potential to go up 100 percent. I think it has a potential to go up this much, at least. Okay. Now, what's my risk? Well, my risk is is this much. If I put my stop at the old lows, and the stop I think is a little bit above that, so my risk is really only going to be this much. Let's do that again. My risk is only going to be about this much. And my reward is going to be possibly this much and maybe even more, okay? So the risk to reward, R to R, is tremendous on this trade, okay? And I'm going to talk about this once again. But remember, if you are trading an emerging trend and the market comes down and makes new lows, guess what? You're wrong. And you have to get out. So let's say you were trying to trade an emerging trend here and it went down new lows. You're wrong. Okay? There wasn't an emerging trend here, but you get my point. As a trend follower, if a market makes a new low, you have to get out of its way. Now, if you back this chart way out, if you look at a weekly or a monthly or whatever, what are you going to see? You're going to see that you're just going to see this big old arrow in the chart, and you might not even notice this little blip here. Okay? So again, this is just a little arrow, and this is a big arrow, okay? So which one's going to win? Okay, I don't know. But when this little one wins, or if this little one wins, then everyone from there on down is on the wrong side of the market. So that's the beauty of an emerging trend pattern, okay? Now, Wilford wants to know, and we don't want to digress too far, and but we'll get to, the, we'll get to all questions, uh, eventually. Uh, he wants to know, why am I using a 10 simple? Okay. Well, the beauty of a 10 simple is it's 10 trading days, which is there's five trading days in a week. So it's five trading days times two gives you 10. So that's two weeks. Okay. As someone who believes you can only predict the short term when it comes to markets, I like that 10-day moving average to tell me where, just about where that market was traded for the last two weeks. So right here, 
I know that we go back 10 days. Let's see, we'll count today's day. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. It's right here. You can see it's relatively unchanged. So we know that the market has moved a whole lot. But when the market does begin to move, notice it begins to drop here. Notice this moving average immediately turns down like that and looks pretty good. So I know that that average... It catches up the price fairly quick, and it gives me a true, represent a true representation for price. Now, once I get to the 20-day moving average and the 30-day moving average, so what is that? That's four weeks and six weeks, respectively. So that's a month worth of trading and six weeks worth of trading. Okay. So now this gives me a longer-term view of what's going on. So shorter term, I want to see what's happened recently, but I want it to kind of average out, and I don't want any fancy math to skew it or anything. But longer term, these exponential moving averages will catch up with the longer term trend quicker. Okay, and then the other great thing about them, which I learned by accident, or I learned from Greg Morris, is that once price crosses through an exponential moving average, they automatically turn up. If you have a longer term simple moving average and let's say price goes through it, let's say this is a 200 day moving average or a 50 day moving average or even a 30 day moving average, it might just keep going down and not do anything, okay? So I find there's different, I guess there's, there's different ways of looking at this, but I find two week moving average catches up fast enough to price and I guess I did it empirically. I started off using a simple moving average and I decided that I wanted longer term exponential moving averages. You'll find that with the bow tie pattern, if you are to use longer term simple moving averages, you're not going to get that nice bow tie. You're going to get this and then you're going to get you might get markets crossing up, okay? But this has to cross up too with those longer term moving averages. It'll be too slow to catch up. So I like the longer term catching up quicker. I just like the shorter term to give you a true representation of price. And at 2 weeks it's still pretty quick to catch up to price too. Okay? Now I'm going to go too far, get too far ahead of myself. So the point I'm trying to make, or was trying to make, is that individual issues are beginning to turn before the sector, and that's normal. And the sector itself is trying to turn a little bit. So I think it's worth taking a shot at these signals. Now, keep in mind, as I preach ad nauseum, with an emerging trend pattern, you're still a pioneer, and like I just said. It's little trend versus big trend, okay? So let's take a look. This is from last week, and we're along this, truth be told, or not truth be told. I'm not hiding anything. It's just uh, full disclosure, I guess. But you can see that the USO, which is the oil, and you see it dropped here. It just keeps dropping, consolidates, keeps dropping, consolidates, keeps dropping, and then we make this major, major low, and then what happens, and then it, goes, then it goes up. Now, Dave, why would you be bullish just on that little up leg? Well, let's look at this. Okay, let's draw a dotted line. It's not a perfect dotted line. But what do we have? We have a month or two of trading where you're making brand new highs, okay? So this thing just went down for a long, long time, all the way to here. And now, all of a sudden, in three days, you take out about a month's worth of trading, and you're beginning to make new highs. You get your little correction in here. This gives you your first thrust. I haven't checked it. It might be a bow tie, too. We'll take a look at it when we get to the charts. Okay. So we've got this little trend. And I know you kind of got to squint your eyes to see it because this thing is, like, uh, pretty darn obvious. Sticks out like a sore thumb. Okay. So you are fighting that longer-term trend. But do notice that this market, if you draw, if you, uh, draw a line through, as many bars as you can, you can see that you got this hook, nice little hook up here, okay? And the deceleration lower is beginning to slow down. Now, well, Dave, it just looks like a longer term pullback. Well, eh, not quite, okay? When you're, if you review, like I said, the stock selection course, let's say you have a market that looks like this, but, and it pulls back. But if you look at back in time and see that that pullback, this market made no forward progress on a net-net basis in over a month or so, then it's possible that even though 
here to here, it's higher from there to there, and the big arrow still points up, it has lost momentum shorter term, and it's possible that this pullback could be a transition in trend. Okay? So again, notice how this market just goes down and down and down and down, and then all of a sudden it starts going up. And notice that now you're beginning to get a base. You're beginning to get lower lows. You got lower lows, but then just marginally. And by the way, with the double bottom, they rarely do that in a textbook W type of fashion. Usually it does, they either come in and it doesn't make it back to old lows, or it does this and it takes out the old lows and then it comes back up. This is my favorite because you get a bit of a fake out and everyone down here thinks, oh, it's going, it's going to keep on going lower. So you have this bottom here and then you get a second bottom, which is lower than the first. Everybody that brother thinks it's going to keep on going lower, okay, and then that's when it begins to fake out like you're seeing now. Okay. All right, lots of questions popping up. I, I never dreamed we'd have so many questions. This is good, though. This is good. Okay. Could that spike up in oil be explained by shorts covering their positions or by taking partial profits? Absolutely. And here's the beauty of that, though. Okay. Now, it might just be that in and of itself, and then it might exhaust itself, but the beauty is. There has to be a catalyst to get a market moving, and we don't care what that catalyst is. But when the shorts start to cover, they all kind of run to the door at the same time. So this could very much be shorts covering, okay? And then what happened? It pulls back a little bit, okay? So any shorts that didn't cover are saying they're breathing a sigh of relief. But this little thrust off of lows is going, going to attract some bottom pickers. So that buying is looming, okay, possibly. And maybe you have a few bottom pickers that already got in. Now, if this trend begins to go higher, then any shorts that didn't finish covering have to finish covering. And new buyers who missed the bottom, those bottom pickers, might start rushing into the market. They're like, Damn, I miss the all-time lows, but I'm going to put my ego aside and I'm going to buy anyway, even though the market's a little bit higher. Okay, and then, and then of course, the trend followers start coming in as it becomes more and more obvious. So who cares what the catalyst is? And that catalyst, that short covering, might actually be a good thing because not all the shorts have covered right away, but they they get the market going, and then all of a sudden – all the rest of the shorts pile on, and guess what? As soon as that happens, the buying is going to be get more and more buying. People who wait, people have been waiting for a bargain, okay? No, don't worry about the short ratio. There's no way, let's say you've got some short ratio or something on a, on a stock or a market or whatever. It, it makes for wonderful newsletter writing, okay? Oh, it's going to take 10 days to cover, or it's got blah, blah, blah. It's the most shorted stock in history. Well, what you fail to realize is the world is a complex place, and you have no idea knowing what derivatives are on that market, and could be that it could have a huge short position, but it could be fully hedged. And you have no way of knowing with all the derivatives. If you are taking partial profit, then your risk to reward is not 400% market. How much could you risk then, considering the pattern as a pioneer? Well, you're no, no, okay. And I have a great example. Okay. Let's say you're risking $2,000, okay? And let's say you take profit somewhere in here, so you make $1,000. Okay, this is your risk. And let's say this thing goes on, and you end up making $10,000 on the second position, okay? So... Let's say it makes a 100% move, so you made a 100% move in the underlying, but as far as money-wise, you made 10 times, you made, what is it, 10, uh, 5,000, 500%. So you end up making 500%. So 
again, go in and watch the the webinar I did. I hope I hope they're out there on YouTube. If not, please somebody remind me, and I'll get them up. I'll put the burden on you to remind me because I got a lot going on. Uh, but I spent two weeks in these week of charts just talking about risk to reward. So go in and watch those to fully get your head around the money management. Okay. Energy stocks like gold stocks seem to be linked to the underlying commodity. Yes, I'm going to talk about efficient markets in just one second. Problem with e efficient markets is they're prone to fits and starts. I don't get too far ahead of myself. You do not like to trade stocks that are efficient, at least on the long side. Well, as a general statement, I don't, but my whole presentation today is going to be on trading efficient stocks. Okay, There are times, which I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but there are times when you're on the cusp of all-time lows or multi-year lows where trading efficient stocks can be worthwhile. Okay, You just have to pick your spots carefully. For example, gold stocks seem to be falling because gold is going down, and therefore any inefficiency in a particular gold stock seems to be muted at best, save goals for oil. Well, that's a good point, uh, but, but let's say that you're in that little – Five dollar gold stock, okay. The ad, let's say gold goes up ten percent. Well, this five dollar gold stock might go up ten points, okay. So this might make a two hundred percent move. So this is vastly more inefficient than this. But yeah, I hear you. You're you're sort of counting on you're counting on an any you're counting on an efficient market to boost your inefficient market. Okay, and I hear you. Uh, they're not my favorite stocks to trade, okay? But you have to play the hand that's dealt. In 2009, okay, I was like, oh, we got some energy stocks bottoming out. Look pretty good. Eh, kind of hate the energies because they can be linked to the underlying commodity. But then what happened? We had the mother of all rallies in those energy stocks, okay? So you have to be willing to play it or risk being left behind. About a year or so ago, uh, I think it was A&D and a couple of other gold stocks it looked beautiful. Gold looked like it was bottoming. So what did we do? We jumped in. We got a swing trade profit out. We scratched out on the rest. Nothing ventured, nothing gained, okay? I think we tried it again six months later and looked like it was bottom, bottoming out. I think we broke even or we lost a little money, okay? So net, net, I think net, net we broke even. I think we lost on the second trade, made money in the first trade. You add it all up, yeah, been better off just sitting on your hands, okay? Uh, here we go again with the golds. Maybe we'll lose money again, okay? And net net will be at a loss for those three trades. Well, that's possible. But what if this time they take off? What if this time they take off like the energies did in two thousand and nine? Okay. So yeah, it's it's it sucks for lack of a better word when well, you're dealing with these efficient type of markets, but. When they go, they could go. And remember, they're still inefficient because they're a company in and of themselves. They may be a little bit more leveraged. If it's a gold company, they may have the potential to find more gold. They may, uh, who knows what reasons, and truth be told, who cares what reasons, okay? I don't know why I'm saying truth be told today. It's just, I hate that saying, by the way. You know, it's like, uh, I hate when you're talking with a salesman or something. I'm going to be honest with you. Oh, you've been lying to me this whole time? Shit. <laughs> Hope you post it on YouTube. Heather. Well, I don't. You know, look, dig around. It should be. Uh, it should be on there. And if if it's not, I'll find it and process it. They don't give me like three weeks though, because by the time I get around to doing that, it'll be a while. Knowing the symbol, you probably point out massive amount of overhead above the market would have appears to be. Okay, Dave, if you looked at the USO chart without knowing the symbol, you probably point out the massive amount of overhead above the market. This happens a lot when people send in their stocks at the end, just saying, all right, Jonathan's trying to catch me on something. No, there's not a massive amount of overhead, okay? There's this much overhead right here, okay? And the market already made it to here. So it's already penetrated into this overhead a little bit, okay? Yes, I see it, and yes, it's there. But it's already penetrated into it a little bit, and it's not that much to clear. And if it does clear it, then we go from where? We go from 19 to 30, okay, before we hit the next little overhead. You know what? That's worth it 
especially in this efficient market, okay? So, yeah, you don't always get perfection, especially in these commodity-related stocks. And that's one problem you're going to see. Take a look at take a look at this one. This is a commod. This is a, a, a an all stock. You got some overhead resistance here, but first of all, it's a pretty good ways away. If it makes it all the way there, you know what? I'm already got a big. I already have a big smile on my face, and all my little peeps are smiling too. Okay, so it's it's all good if we make it to this, and it's not that much. Okay, it's not like a big old range like this. Now, if you do look at the energies, you're going to see quite a few of them look like this. Okay, go in and rewatch the stock selection webinar where we talked a lot about this overhead supply. And you're going to see that right now, there's a lot of textbook examples of a lot of stocks you should not be trading in the energies. And the goals, too, for that matter. Especially in the energies, though. And the reason is, well, if you just look at the overall chart, if you look at the overall sector, there's a fairly significant amount of overhead supply right there, as you can see. But as far as I'm concerned, from where I sit, this doesn't look like a whole lot of problems. And it's only, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. It's only about a week and change of trading, if that much. And again, we've already peeped into it. We've already poked into it once, okay? Keep in mind that, it, that um, if you have resistance and you start poking it, that resistance gets weaker and weaker and weaker every time you poke it, all right? Because whoever bought here, and it all of a sudden, oh, it's back there. They start getting out, okay? And maybe that's why the market actually pulled back, because maybe it did hit that overhead supply, and maybe that's why we're beginning to pull back, okay? We may not have enough time to get to everything. Let's talk about this real quick. Um, let's talk about an introduction. Let's, it, let me introduce you to understanding market efficiency and trading efficient stocks. Now, we spent probably an hour on market efficiency in the stock selection webinar or course, I should say. So it can be hard to kind of sum it up in just that. And then also I did a, a fairly lengthy article. It was so long that I talked to my editor over at Traders, and he says, well, it's a little long, but I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll make it the cover story. So it's a cover story in the German edition. And it should be out in English uh, over the next month or so. So there's a lot to market efficiency that I can sum up really quickly here. But let me give it a shot. Now, efficient market hypothesis states that everything is priced into a market, so you're foolish to think that you could beat the market. And they're right to some extent when it comes to very efficient stocks. So if you got a stock where you can look at the earnings, you can look at their competitors, and you crunch a bunch of, bunch of fundamental numbers, you have a pretty good idea about where they should be trading. But you can't figure out where a little biotech or some sort of uh, extremely inefficient stocks should be trading. So their theory comes apart with less efficient stocks. A solar stock with the promise of solving the world's energy crisis doubles over a few days. A biotech, for instance, that uh, has a promise of curing a horror disease, okay, doubles or something over a few days. And these prices, these markets are not efficient. The large potential moves are not priced in. So again, it doesn't have to be a technological revelation that will, this should be that, let me fix that that will solve the world's problems. It might be burritos, movie delivery, or even comfortable yoga clothes, uh, especially for guys like me who eat too many burritos, right? So smaller yet discovered companies are more inefficient. Now the question is, how important is inefficiency? Well, let's take a look at, at the aforementioned uh, little solo stock, right? And we had quite a few of these. If you remember, go back and download the archives from 2013. We had quite a few of them. Uh, SCTY is another one comes to mind. It was an IPO. Solar City took off nicely. Okay. This stock went up 761%. Now, you're not going to catch that exact bottom, but I think we had about a 600% run in this before it corrected down and stopped out. And we caught the lion's share of the move, which is, if he gets five, 600% of the stock, you're doing okay. <laughs> you just need one of those a year to make a year, okay? So actually it was 2012, I stand corrected, where these uh, solar stocks were going to take it off. So this thing ran up 761%. You're not going to see the U.S. dollar go to seven times the euro or vice versa, at least not over a year's period of time. 
And if we do, the world has blown up. Okay, we've either blown up or yours blown up, and you might not want to be alive anyway. Okay, I don't want to get morbid on you. The zombie apocalypse would be here. Now, again, this is about an hour or maybe two hours worth of of a lengthy explanation. Explanation. Let me just uh, bang it out really quick here. Inefficiency e increases as volatility increases, as quantifiable fundamentals decrease. Okay. Um, I think the example I used in the article was a little biotech stock. Uh, it might have been the one where one of them that were long recently, either MVRO or Kite or one of those, CTLT or CLDX. I forget which one. But it was one of those stocks. And I just looked up the earnings on it just for SGs, and I think they lost $2.91 last year. Don't quote me on that. You can read the article and get the exact numbers. But it was a lot of money. It's like a $15 stock, and they lost a couple bucks. So – you could, you don't have to argue. There's no fundamentals there. What's, why do you start a company? Okay. Well, you might have some altruistic vision. If you have lots of money, then you can start a company with altruistic vision, and you don't care if you lose money. But for most people, you start a company to make money. So a company needs to make money, and that's the main reason you start a company is to make money. Okay. You might be doing good things or bad things, but the bottom line is you want to make money. So fundamentals are obviously are obviously the ultimate goal. So if you don't have fundamentals, then the stock trades on promise alone. Okay, stocks that are lower in volatility. Now it might just be a self fulfilling prophecy, but they tend to be more efficient than stocks that are higher in volatility. Okay, and the beauty of the higher volatility stocks is they've already demonstrated they they have already demonstrated they can make inefficient moves. So maybe they're worth trading. The more known a company is, PepsiCo, is probably going to be more efficient than Sky People Fruit Juice. Okay. The larger the cap the company, obviously, the more efficient it's going to be than a smaller cap issue. As these are all general statements. Now, again, I don't have an hour or two to spend just on inefficiency and efficiencies. But it's a subject that's worth studying, and one thing I just want to kind of throw out at you, there's a lot of other things that, that need to be discussed here, but one of the things to remember is keep in mind that efficiency is a moving target, okay? So company, small companies get big. Sometimes big companies get small. I have what I call the Phoenix strategy where you wait for a stock to fall from grace. Well, that stock, before it falls from grace, might be a very efficient stock. Also, Download the pattern on my website, uh, GoGoNomo, which is uh, a, a pattern where you look for an efficient stock. You look for it to fall from grace. GMCR, I think, was a recent, the last victim there. I think it was a victim there a couple years ago. It was another victim. victim. Uh, Chipotle, when Chipotle fell from grace, was another one of those type of stocks. So, again, without giving the whole efficiency speech, Efficient markets can make inefficient moves, okay? Now, if you're trading a currency or a commodity, the disadvantage is they're very crowded playing fields. With a currency, you've got a lot of countries that might be countries of governments that might be manipulating the currencies. <gasps> no, Dave, they wouldn't do that. Oh, yes, they will. Central banks, uh, financial institutions, you might have uh, a big company needs to buy some something from Japan or whatever, and they have to hedge their bet or their, their purchase, right? Because if they ink a deal for, let's say, half a billion dollars, okay, and all of a sudden the market changes and the market skyrockets, currency skyrockets or something, well, now all of a sudden they're paying uh, an extra $10 million for the item. So what they could do is they could spend a couple of million dollars and maybe hedge that bet, okay? Uh, speculators, obviously, uh, hedgers betting that it's going to do so much, or they might be hedging again, like the like the businesses might be hedging their bets. Um, there are some advantages, believe it or not, to um, to efficient markets. There's obviously liquidity; you can get in and out all you want. Okay, you can get in and out all day long. Um, you're trading the little IPO 
Or are you trading a little solar stock? Are you trading a little biotech stock? Might be kind of thin. Might be kind of choppy, okay, at times. So, or, or just thin when you're trying to get in and out of it, obviously. So you do have liquidity, and occasionally they can make inefficient moves if you pick your pot spots carefully, which we're going to talk about today. Also, you got to remember commodities, a uh, very efficient market, too. Because let's say you're producing a commodity, well, you might be selling it forward to try to lock in your prices. You might have expenses if you could sell your crop forward or your oil forward or your gold forward or whatever. That gives you working capital or at least locks it a profit so you can dig more oil or gold or grow something. Okay, And then you might have processes and distributors need to lock in their prices, so they might be buying forward. Speculators could be speculating. Okay. And then, of course, there could be spreaders out there, arbitragers arbitraging, and then central banks and government action in some cases. And then I shouldn't say this, but it could be some manipulation, okay? Hedging, wasn't that the purpose of the commodities market? That was the original purpose, I think, of the commodities market was hedging so that companies could uh, buy and sell. But then, you know, the speculator plays a role in that, okay? So the speculator kind of comes in and fills the gap between the hedgers, so the trading, if somebody ever tells you trading uh, serves no purpose, tell them to first, um, well, I can't say it because it's PG-13, but then explain to them that, uh, like in a commodity market, they, you know, the uh, commodity market zero-sum game. Well, yeah, it is, but you're, you're serving a purpose by providing some liquidity to that market. Now, I don't want to get too altruistic. Yeah, we are, we're, ultimate goal is just to make money, right? Um, now, inefficient moves can occur in currencies and other markets. So the goal is to find a disequilibrium, easy for me to say, disequilibrium in price, find out where that is most likely to occur. And that's most likely, likely to occur after a major or ideally all-time high or low. And that's because the most people will be on the wrong side of the market. Again, like I've been saying, like in the oil, okay, it's doing this, 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 it starts doing this. Well, if it keeps doing this, all of these people are wrong, okay? But, yeah, you're still fighting that longer-term trend, absolutely. The other thing is they're going to be forced out as the trend develops, okay? And then those people who didn't buy the bottom or near the bottom, they need to, be make, they need to make a decision, okay? Put up a shut-up or they're going to be forced out. And then the bargain hunters will have to get in or risk being left behind, okay? So those that have to buy the market are going to be forced in eventually, and the bargain hunters who try to catch the bottom either have to decide whether or not it's worth it to them to, to jump in at higher prices or risk being left behind. So again, with transitional patterns, we're looking for a prior uptrend, and then a turning of that trend. We're not trying to guess the top here, 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 or even here. We're waiting for that trend to begin, that new downtrend to begin to emerge. That's why I also uh, it interchanged the word emerging with transitions. And then we're looking for that first little correction. Now, you don't wait for it to correct all the way back up to a certain level, although it might. You don't wait for that to happen because if you wait for that to happen and this thing begins to slide, then all the people that were waiting for that to happen will be trapped out of the market and forced to get in or forced to bail. Now, you might have people that are waiting for that market to go back to new highs. Okay, so let's market slides. They might be waiting for it to go back to new highs to get out of break even because they bought late in the cycle. And if that never materializes and all it has is that one little blip and then it dies, then they're going to be forced out. Remember, think about everything that's going on behind the scenes from a logical standpoint, okay? Now, first thrust, I'm not going to spend too much time on the first thrust because most of you know the pattern. If not, read the book. But brand new lows, big thrust from lows, you look to enter after the first signs of a correction. And on the short side, obviously, brand new highs, thrust lower, 
you look to enter after the first signs of a correction, which could be as little as a one bar pullback. Bow ties, you're looking for obviously a crossing of the 10, 20, 30 over a short period of time. Looks like a bow tie. Okay. Like a bow tie. Like a, like a little stick man with a bow tie. I'm not too good. My drawing's not so good. Um, and then you look to get in at the first signs of a correction. Okay. Now, I forget which market this is. It's one of the currency markets uh, from a while back. But it made a significant high, a major, major high. It might have been the euro. And then you can see it began to slide here. So it pulls back a little bit. You look to short somewhere around the first signs of correction. It didn't give you instant gratification. But then you can see that eventually it began to implode. And that is a very inefficient move, especially if you consider uh, a currency. Okay. And if you think about it, once an efficient market begins to move like that, that inefficiency begins to kick in because people begin getting – think about what's going on with, with the big players in there. And if they're on the wrong side of the market or, or if they're trying to hedge a billion-dollar deal, they better get in there quickly and do something. Okay, So that can kind of force their hand. And that's the other thing. It's kind of hard to explain. Let me just, let me just try it. Um, interest rates, for instance, let's say, let's say, uh, interest rates are doing this. Well, you're not going to see a whole lot of home refinancing until when, until they begin to do this. Why? Because everybody just kind of, everybody becomes complacent as the market's going down, waiting for it to go, waiting for it to go down further and further and further and further. Okay. So when a market's at all time highs like this, everybody's kind of happy of the trend and they're not forced to make a decision. Once that market begins to slide like this, all of a sudden, they're forced to make a decision. And in an inefficient market, I'm sorry, in an efficient market, in an efficient market, okay, this slide from an all-time high, because most people are on the wrong side of the market coming in, this was a longer trend coming in, that inefficient move can, I don't know if this is the correct way of saying it, can exacerbate itself or it can... Uh, um, last time I said that, somebody said, Dave, I thought you were keeping the show PG-13. Uh, <laughs> but it, it can um, become a self-fulfilling prophecy and materialize. Okay. Let's take a look at the bow tie. This is obviously euro dollar here, euro over dollar. You can see it makes this multi-year highs, and that was probably the year on that prior chart. You get a, you get a, a bow tie down. And then you get a nice slide out of that bow tie. Um, I forget. Oh, here it is right here. Euro, Aussie dollar from a while back. You can see coming off of major lows. And then it begins to bow tie. I don't know. What's the date on this? This is probably 28.8.12. How do you read that European date? Is that 8.28.12? It would be fun to go in and look at the Euro, Aussie dollar from, and I haven't done it, uh, eight, I guess it's 8.28.12 because, uh, when I do charts for these shows, and I forget where this presentation was, that I did this, this uh, I don't know if this was my when I was in Russia or whenever, I do, try to, I do try to find something that's current, just like we just talked about oil. I do try to find something that's very current, so a year from now, two year, years from now, we go and look at that. I've got my currency uh, screen down for the webinar, but it'd be fun to go in and see what the, what the euro did against the Aussie dollar from 2012 up until now, and, and whether or not that trend uh, materialized. Um, again, I don't know why I didn't put the no GP. Okay, this is Great Britain pound versus Aussie dollar. Notice it's making a major, major low here. You get a bow tie, and then you get a very inefficient move out of it. Okay, so in summary, the inefficient markets can offer the best opportunities. You want to be in that solar stock that's going to go up six or seven hundred percent, that biotech stock that's going to go up several hundred percent, or something like that. But inefficiencies can occur in efficient markets like currencies and commodities. You have to pick your spots very carefully in efficient markets. And the best spots, so to speak, are emerging trends from the fringe are going to offer the best opportunity. So offer that major all-time lows or offer that um, major, major lows or highs, okay? The euro Aussie dollar went up to 155 by 2014, okay? Where was it did? 150, yeah, okay, so it did It did make a, um, 
And uh, if we could find, if I could figure out when I did this presentation, maybe it was on eight twenty eight twelve. I need to find out what I was doing back then. I may have been in Russia then. Um, so Phil saying that it's it's off the charts, literally off the charts. So it's somewhere up here, uh, or way up here from this move here. Now I um, I didn't know it was going to work out. I like to use live examples to see what happens, and that way I'm not a hundred percent in hindsight. I'm not showing you some examples from five years ago like I just did. <laughs> and say, hey, look, this is how easy it is. So it's harder to show things in real time. A, a buddy of mine was uh, pointing out, in fact, Emilio Tomasini, uh, who I'll be seeing here um, um, on Monday, um, he pointed out that um, much harder to to run a, an ongoing trading service where you're giving live signals than it is to teach something and say, oh, you know, here, buy my course and go out and do it. Just go do it. Okay? So much harder to do that to show things live. Uh, just real quick, since we're talking about these emerging trends, because I know we got a lot of questions in here, and I don't want to jump into the charts, but just real quick, back to the stops. I just want to reiterate, reiterate one more time. Uh, we've been talking a lot about stops the last couple of weeks. So getting back to stops, where would a position be of failure is what you need to ask yourself. And since we're talking about emerging trends this week, let's talk about emerging trends. And this is the USO once again. And notice that uh, we had a nice rally off of lows, and then we had the setup here. And your entry is here, which, as you know, already triggered. Well, if it comes, if it triggers, it comes all the way back in to near its prior lows. Then you have to question whether or not that position has failed, and just probably just go ahead and bail out. If you could stomach the old lows, then put a stop down there. Just trade fewer shares to compensate. Keep in mind that a lot of times markets will sometimes thrust off of lows, come back down, rechallenge those lows, actually take them out a little bit, and then take off again. Okay, and or maybe stall just shy of these old lows. One thing you'll find with some of these transitional patterns, and this might be a good example here. This was a dollar yen from last week. We had this gatekeeper pattern. Now the market has since rallied up uh, significantly. But so far, that 121 has held. So sometimes with these transitional patterns, they'll, they'll signal the all-time highs. Bonds, for instance, had a gatekeeper which signaled the all-time highs a few years ago. Our gold especially had a gatekeeper. And now it, it, it did look more like it didn't do this, okay, but it did more like it did like this for a while and eventually worked its way lower. We'll take a look at that in one minute, okay. So, again, just to reiterate one more time, again, this is a slide we looked at a minute ago. You are fighting the big blue arrow when you are trading these emerging trends. But if the market takes off, the upside could be potentially unlimited, and your downside, either a stop here or even worse, doubt the old lows, is your limited. So limited gain limited I'm sorry losses and possibly unlimited gains when you're trading those emerging trends. Uh what other point you're going to be wrong more with emerging trend patterns than you are in generic pullback patterns. You let's trade let's say you're trading a generic pullback of our IPO, uh inefficient market, uh Everybody's happy. The market just pulled back a little bit. It takes off, like some of the pullbacks we traded lately. Kite, I think, is one. Uh, CTLT. The markets like that, you're much better off in a market like that, waiting for a, a trend to become a little bit more established and get in than you are to take a transitional pattern. You're much better off from an accuracy standpoint because once a trend is established, the chances of that trend resuming is better than the trend turning because again you still might be fighting the longer term trend okay um, if you want to keep these webinars free <laughs> you just have to buy something so go to the store check it out um, if you need anything I don't know what I'm gonna be doing while I'm traveling I will be on screen but I don't know if I'm gonna do a lot of um, sales while I'm traveling so if you need anything uh, today or tomorrow would be the day to get it uh, from the store. Um, also, I will be doing the service for those of you who are on the service. I will be doing the service when I travel. Sometimes it's a little bit abbreviated, but the same amount of analysis is going to be done every day. It's going to be kind of cool. I'm in Italy because I could do my analysis between 10 and 12 at night, 
and then I could publish the next morning. So it'd be fun to go out and uh, hang out in the Italian countryside. The market closes at 10 o'clock at night, thereabouts. And then I could do my analysis, wake up the next day, make sure I still believe everything I see. Or if I have uh, too much uh, <laughs> too much beer or anything, I'll make sure that the charts still look pretty good the next day. A um, couple announcements. with uh, I have a stock selection course and an IPO course. Both of these have unlimited lifetime support. That doesn't mean you call me up and say, hey, Dave, I'm building a trading system. Let's work on this together. No, that's a different type of consulting. That costs a lot of money. But if you say, hey, Dave, I'm looking at this IPO. What do you think? And I'll say yes or no, and then I'll probably make you go back in and rewatch that part of the webinar, the seminar that um, deals with the IPO. I should say course. But, yeah, also same thing with stock selection course, limited lifetime support, again, within reason. And then with the stock selection course right now, is uh, you get one year of the service free, so it's like getting a that's a fifteen hundred, and I'm sorry, yeah, about a fifteen hundred dollars saving. Anyway, uh, I'm not gonna hash rehash the rest of this. We've got too much to cover, so let's hop out into the charts. Um, I'll try to do a little bit of both. I'll try to get uh, cover as many questions as possible, and you can start asking about individual uh, issues now if you like. So let me get my charts up and running, and then we'll uh, I'll bang out some of these questions real quick. What I like to do when I get to the charts is I like to look at the macro, micro and then work my way out to the macro. So let's do that now. Let me just get a sip of water. This Mountain Dew is kind of uh, kind of getting to me. Okay, and let me try to get some these questions, general questions, knocked out before we get to the charts. We should have enough time. I'm sorry, individual stock questions. Okay, we answered this one. Okay. I have followed Denbury Res on and off for a while. I don't know what that means. Is that somebody? I don't know who that is. Okay. So. Are you following me too? Is that what you hear? Is the price level 2021... 22 USO consider minor resistance. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, you might have a little bit of resistance here around this. Uh, let's get the. Let's do this. Uh, you might have a little resistance there. And that would be a good second entry. If you uh, miss the first entry, which you'd be lucky if you missed the first entry. Okay, um, let me see if there's any, any other questions that aren't specific. Um, David, when a day the chart looks like USO, when I look USO today, the SMA 10 is already crossed, the 20 is at a close across, so is this an entry signal for you? Um, yeah, I mean, we're already long, the, uh, but, but the USO... The USO did not make a bow tie yet. It just made a first thrust, okay? So it had a big thrust off the lows, and then it had a one-bar pullback, and then it triggered, and then so far, it's kind of stalled out, okay? Dave, I thought you said it was bottom. Well, I thought it was a bottom, but market's efficient. What are you going to do, okay? It might have some fits and starts. All right, let's start with the micro, work our way out to the macro. Um Recently, I did a column, and I said that uh, you got three guys feeling an elephant, okay? And each guy feels something different. Well, they're blind, by the way. They're blind. That makes a big difference. So a blind guy feeling an elephant's grabbing the, grabbing the tail. He thinks it's a rope. He's grabbing a, he's grabbing a leg. He thinks it's, a, a, I guess, a column. And I don't know. What, they, what do they think the, the trunk is? Anyway, it's going to feel different to each blind man depending on where they're standing okay so I think we're in a market now especially since it's range bound to where depends on where you look you could find good and bad now the other thing that's happening is there's a lot of things that are kind of jerking the market around a little bit and one thing that's been pointed out quite a bit by quite a few people is that yeah we're in a range but the volatility within that range has been pretty impressive and it has for a range bound market but that also tells me that nobody's in control, and I'm just thinking out. I'm just that just thought 
just came to me. Um, when a market is, is zigzagging back and forth, it tells me that, well, bull, bears are in control. No, bulls are in control. No, bears are in control. No, bulls, bears, bulls, bears, bulls, okay? So nobody's in control. Now, on a micro basis, let's, let's just go back to last Friday. Last Friday, we had a bit of a shot across the bow with interest rates, and it bonds began to implode, which I can punch up real quick. Or we might have them, okay? So bonds began to kind of implode, and then areas like the REITs got creamed, and areas like utilities also got creamed. So let's take a look at those real quick. So last Friday, it looked like things were beginning to come and glued, at least a little bit. Uh, maybe I don't have real estate in here. Company, let's try some name. Okay, there's utilities, and you can see that they did kind of implode recently, and now they're just kind of meandering in here. And then the REITs made a big move, too. Now, REITs are a great example. I don't want to digress too far. Real estate, here we go. REITs are a great example of this is a fairly inefficient move, this huge wide-range bar, given the volatility of the underlying instrument. So we could see, I hate to say it, a crash, but we could see a very inefficient move out of this, what, efficient market, okay? So last Friday, shot across the bow, things look a little iffy, and then what's happened since then? Well, the market has rallied up. And so far, we are closing in on what? And the P's, all-time highs, less than a half a percent away from all-time highs. So Dave, if it gets all-time highs, should we buy? No, settle down, B, it's just not that simple. Wait to see if it breaks out and sticks, okay, before looking to buy. And then maybe even wait for that first little pullback and then wait for an entry, of course, on that. Okay, a little first pullback after a base breakout might be a great thing. Um, one thing that bothers me a little bit is uh, one plausible scenario I've been talking about ad nauseum is what would happen if the – everybody everybody, their brothers watched in 1975, so – what would happen if this market actually went down and probed that 1975, which is down here, which also, watch this, this is pretty cool, which also corresponds with the 200-day moving average, okay? And if you have traded long enough, looked at enough charts, you'll find that a lot of times support is going to agree with something like a 200-day moving average. In other words, a lot of technicals will come together at the same point. So we're stuck in a range. Let's not get too excited, even if we get out of that range. Um, you know, I used to date a little country girl, and she said, if I had my rathers, uh, well, if I had my which I'd evidently she'd rather somebody else, too, uh, which is good. Uh, <laughs> I'd rather not be with her anyway. Uh, but long story endless, um, if I had my rathers, I'd like to see this market pro below this 1975. Why? Well, it would it would shake out. Anyone who's watching that level as a line in the sand. But I don't want it to just drop. I want it to, like, drop through that level and then turn around and go right back up, cut below that 200-day that moving average. And you'll find sometimes that in a, in a range-bound market, if a market makes a false move out of the range or makes a move out of the range, the next move can sometimes be the true move. So don't get me wrong. I'm a trend follower or a trend following moron, as some people say. So if we do break out of this range, then that would be a good thing, provided that we stick. Okay, if we break out the stick, then I am, I'm a believer. Okay, but just remember, you want to wait and not anticipate. Now, Nasdaq break it out today. That's a beautiful thing. I'm excited. Okay, I'm jumping up and down. I, I you know, I sit around, look at this stupid market for three months, and then what do I decide to leave the country? What's going to happen? Well, finally, we get a movement out, and that's why you know, the market doesn't care about your time frame. So the market's doesn't care that I'm working off my little laptop. I don't have my six screens, and I'm just looking at that little screen, staring at the little screen at midnight. It doesn't care that I'm over there. It can't, you know, could it just chop sideways for a little while longer, wait till I get back? No, it's not how it works. Market doesn't care about your time frame. But so what? I don't care. That's fine. Um, at least I'll be eating good food and seeing beautiful countryside and staring at my little laptop. That's fine with me. But we did break out to... 14-year plus highs today. 
And, you know, somebody said we'd never get to 5,000 again. It, we might not, but uh, look at that, 4,800. So we're not too far away from that 5,000 handle. A couple of hundred points, obviously. Uh, Russell 2000. Russell 2000 so far today is having a good day. Now, one thing I want to throw out that I've been saying to column ad nauseum is that keep in mind that towards the top of a range, everything's going to look like it's great in the world, and towards the bottom of the range, everything's going to look a little ominous. So you don't want to get too excited when the market is on the edge of a range like that, okay? All right, my questions have moved. LOL, had my rathers with somebody else. I'm going to spit out my coffee. <laughs> if I had my rathers, <laughs> if I had my rathers, we'd go eat some taters. <laughs> taters. <laughs> All right, um, let's just take a look at a few of these markets. Obviously, I beat the dead horse on energies. I still think they're bottoming in here. Uh, gold, I still think it's bottoming, but, hey, with gold, it's always tough. Uh, they never make it easy on you, okay, with these commodity-related areas. So why trade them? Well, because sometimes they can work big. We just rewind the last hour of what I just talked about, okay? I've uh, been really worried about the banks, and they were on the cusp of uh, absolutely imploding. But thank goodness that they didn't. I'm not gonna. I wouldn't say they're all they're all clear. Let's let's start kissing each other. Uh, certainly don't want to run out and buy them yet. But look at what's going on today. Decent move today. Higher so far. They probe new lows and bounce nicely off of them and come right back up. Uh, some of these areas that were breaking down out of their ranges again a testament for not buying that first initial break are now coming back up nicely, like insurance. Uh, the semiconductors, big fan of the semis when it comes to helping determine market direction. I, I keep saying I'm old school in that. I guess if I was old, old, old school, I'd be using the transports. But back in the early 90s, I liked to watch the semis as they related to the indices and vice versa. And so far, so good. Hopefully, this is a... Is harbinger the right word? Is, is, a harbinger, is a harbinger always a bad thing? Can a harbinger be a good thing? Well, hopefully this is a um, precursor of good things to come in the S&P. Some people like to watch retail. Uh, it's, a, it's a, I guess, it's an economic-related thing. And so far, so good. And retail, as you can see, break it out to new highs. As I said earlier, utilities uh, looking a little iffy in here. You might want to stick a fork in them. Looks like it's getting pretty close. My only problem with utilities is, and I've been looking at stocks lately, a lot of them for my peeps, and I put a few of them on my Landry list lately for them to look at too, but a lot of these stocks, uh, one, they are very inefficient. I'm sorry. I meant to say. Not just They're very low in volatility, okay? doesn't mean they can't still make an inefficient move, but they're so low in volatility, you have to really sit on them and trade quite a few shares to capture a big move. And the other problem is a lot of them have a lot of, of supply, I'm not supply, I'm sorry, support below the market. So that's something to keep an eye on. What else is going on? I always think I'm going to spend a lot of time on the sectors, and there's really not a whole lot to discuss. Um, drugs and biotech, longer-term uptrend still intact, but they've lost quite a bit of momentum as of late. So it's possible that new areas like the semiconductors and retail or beginning to emerge. That's fine with me. We'll get stopped out of our biotech stocks and, and drugs, and then we'll just we'll start buying retail and we'll start buying semis, whatever, okay? I heard copper is a leading indicator. What do you think? Uh, I can't argue with that. Um, what's it? They say a stock market has a copper top or a roof with copper top. What's the old saying? Something like that. Um. Certainly in, uh, what, what year was this? 2007 it was. Um, you know, you got to be careful not to get too many moving parts, but you have to watch everything, but you got to be careful not to put too many things together, okay? And I, I know that's talking out of both sides of my mouth. Uh, copper is something that I really don't watch. I do watch all these other, um, well, I mean, I watch the copper stocks. I watch the energy stocks. I watch the energy crude the commodity i watch gold uh well, i pretty much watch everything but i don't necessarily try to connect the dots with the intermarket technical analysis like I, I tell everyone 
read John Murphy's book on inner market tactical analysis. Go to my website, go to store, go to books, and they go into more books to read. And then you'll get about 35 cents if you buy it off Amazon. But 35 cents is better than nothing. I'll put it towards my go to webinar uh, software payments. Okay. But read that book on inner market technical analysis, but don't rush out and try to apply it, at least not right away. And keep in mind that it only matters when it matters. And then the other thing, and even Murphy says this in the book, is very long lead and lag times. So, yeah, copper might bottom out or copper might do whatever, and the market might follow suit, but that might be a lead or a lag time that's so big it's no longer tradable. But sometimes you can find perfect correlations or perfect adverse correlations between two markets and I would I would stop short of saying you could trade one off the other but you could certainly use one as confirmation off of the other so it only matters when it matters if I had unlimited time um, I think you could probably and this could be fodder for somebody's research but I think you could probably look at two markets from an intermarket technical analysis standpoint either positive correlation or negative correlation whatever the case may be and then have an indicator uh, have a positive uh, correlation indicator and a negative correlation indicator and when those indicators were uh, high enough meaning that the markets were highly correlated either inversely or not then it would be worth trading those markets uh, and hopefully that made sense if it didn't make sense then then, then obviously you don't want to bother trying to program that okay but if you want to uh, do that. Let me know. Oh my, OMG! I'm, you are hilarious. Why am I? I'm talking about intermarket. What's so funny about intermarket technical analysis? It must be an old. Uh, yeah. Well, last week I was talking about wearing a thong. So, <laughs> if we are Beavis, what does that mean? And you, what does that make you? <laughs> Very good. Uh, a lot of times I'll see settle down, Beavis. Ah, oh, no kidding. I need. <laughs> good point. I never thought about that. Well, it's okay. I'll be butthead. Know this webinar. I hope you post today. Oh, yeah. You know what? I'll do that. I'll post it. Like I said, I think as long as everybody appreciates it, uh, um, I'll do that. SPWR also had a bow tie, but for mid-levels. Yeah, you, you will get mid-level bow ties, and whether or not you want to trade those, um, it depends. I mean, uh, like in the energies, for instance, we did have we have bow ties down. You were coming off of fairly major highs, multi-year highs, or thereabouts. So, you know, that's that's worth looking at. Um, like right here, you can see that was the bow tie that we sold off of in the energies, at least in the uh, underlying commodity. But, yeah, so those mid-level ones are not as important. Um, let me show you something in GLD real quick. Remember, I talked about the gatekeeper in gold. It might have been a weekly gatekeeper. It might be easier to look at it. Uh, sometimes it, these emerging trend patterns... Let me clean the chart up. Can come off of all-time highs, and that becomes the high forever. It doesn't mean that it doesn't try to retest it. See, that's the all-time high in gold, and that's the gatekeeper that it made. Now, I mean, could you have held on through all these zigs and zags? I don't know, but you could see it never did take out that gatekeeper. So, if you shorted the market right there, you never would have been underwater in the trade. Well, you'd given up a significant amount of gains, almost all your gains along the way, but you could see that you never would have been underwater. So sometimes those emerging trend patterns, such as gatekeeper, bow tie, et cetera, can uh, nail the top of the bottom. All right, we're going to have to go through a lightning round to get through the um, stocks. Chris on a pullback. Uh, maybe, but the problem is you're pushing into a lot of uh, – this one did catch my eye, but you're pushing it as overhead resistance. And, you know, but Dave, you said if it pushes into it, well, so far, so good. But then you got a gap to overcome, and then you got even more overhead resistance. So you got a lot of bad memories. So I hear you. It's going straight up, but how long can it sustain that, especially with all this trading uh, over here? So I think it would pass. URH, URA looks like OIH, BTW. URA, a lot of... Uh, Oh, uranium. Uh, lots of um, – well, no. It doesn't look like um, – whatchamacallit, because it doesn't you – know, yeah, if you're just looking at this right here, yeah, absolutely. It's beautiful. Unfortunately, it's got a lot of uh, trading to overcome, so I would pass on trying to do anything there. I, I think you just make an observation, but thank you. 
Okay. Uh, Gary says, how can gold stocks go up when the euro is in a dumper? I don't know. But let me tell you something. The more logic, the more that a market defies logic, the better the trend will be. If, if you want to make money trading and you want to incorporate some kind of logic into your trades, then look for markets with shitty fundamentals and buy them, okay, or provided they're moving technically, okay. Look for good news events and sell that market when it takes out that good news day. Look for bad events like uh, when Steve Jobs died, for instance. I tell that story over and over. Somebody asked me what, what to do when, when Jobs dies, and it's like wait for the market to have a reaction and then look to go the other way. Well, you buy the market when it comes back through that price. So fade the news and use anti-fundamentals, anti-seasonals, anti-logic, and those will make the best. Those will make for the best markets. Now, the problem is, you know, Dave, how could the market rally when the euro's doing this or Europe's doing this or whatever? Well, sometimes it won't. And you'll think, aha, I knew I should have bought that market. So the next time I see Europe doing this or Europe doing that or whatever happened, I'm, I'm, I'm going to sell short. And then guess what? The market's going to go up. So do pay attention to tacticals, but remember, they're not always right, okay? VIP, Russian Contra Wisdom Play. Here we go. VIP? Is that VIP? That's a Russian stock? You got a little overhead. I want to be careful and not talk too much about it because I don't want anybody to nail me on that. But a little overhead supply. A lot of overhead supply here. That would be great to get up to 8 bucks a share. But you do have a little bit to fight through. I'd almost like to see it probe into this a little bit before getting too excited. I don't see a setup just yet. Why would that be a Contra Rush, Russian uh, thing? Rig? I'm getting a few questions on this one. Um, the problem with rig is I don't really particularly like this gap lower here so much. Um, if you looked at that stock that I showed earlier in the slides, I like that one a lot better because it's a lot cleaner pattern. And then you do have some, but not a tremendous amount, but some overhead supply to overcome. But, hey, if it rallies from 20 to 30, who cares? Uh, so do I like it over here? Yes. I just don't like the gap down and all. Take a, a tool through your uh, oil fill stocks and uh, see if there's something you like. Nate, you have found the stock that I have recommended for today, and uh, congratulations to you, and high five. I knew somebody would find it, so Nate found it. Good job, Nate. TLT sitting on the 50. TLT, Mr. Phil likes that 50. Good, uh, good observation there, Phil. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, I'm not a big fan of the 50-day moving average, but I, I have to tell you, when a market begins to crack, that's the first thing I put on my charts. That Well, the bow ties go first, and then I put the 50-day moving average. But, yeah, at a 50-day moving average, nothing magical about it or any other average, but it can contain a lot of a market's moving. moving. If you just follow daylight, you would stay short through this whole downtrend here. You'd be long to this last little leg higher here. In fact, you actually would have been long for quite a long, long time just by looking at the daylight, meaning that the lows are greater than the moving average. So good point on that, Phil. Don't you have to at least be aware of and consider macro issues? No. Why? Why? You know, uh, you're going to make me tell the story again. See, Robert's a little bit newer. He's a newer client. Uh, I was speaking at Traders Expo years ago, that, that freezing one they have up in New York. Uh, every they, always, they pick the coldest day in February for the New York one. I think they picked the hottest day in the summer for the, for the one in Florida. But anyway, I'm up there freezing my butt off, and I'm showing shorts and oil stocks. You know, And some guy's like, what about the situation in Nigeria? I'm like, what about the situation in Nigeria, okay? If anything, that Contra news event is going to work. Okay, don't you have to at least be aware uh, that consider macro issues or something besides pure chart patterns? Okay, in, two, in 1999, stocks were going straight up. Was there any chance most of these stocks were going to be viable setups? I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, were there any fundamentals in any of these stocks? No. Were they going up? Yes. 
Schaubacher once said, and I quote him every week, fundamentals suggest what a stock ought to be doing, and technicals are what a stock is doing. Okay? Now, if you ever get really confused, go to www.do not confuse the issue with facts.com and you will find all your answers there. You could also go to www. Don't confuse the issues with facts. Don't confuse the issue with facts.com. Uh, just leave out the apostrophe, and, and then everything you need to know will be explained. Don't you have to at least be aware of and consider macro issues or something besides pure chart patterns when dealing with gold or oil stocks? Oh, I should have read the second pattern. No, what about the situation in Nigeria? Because they are connected to the underlying commodity. Well, yeah, but but so what? Uh, USO looks like it's trying to make a turn. And what's happening with these individual gold stock, all stocks? They look like they're trying to make a turn. So yeah, you have to look at the underlying commodity, but that has that's not macroeconomics, okay? Uh, if you were looking at uh, the the growth rate of Europe and an unemployment rate and all these other things. Yeah, that's macroeconomics. But it's, it's, if I'm just looking at a market on a price chart, that's technical analysis. And that's all it is, okay? ATW for John. Okay. A couple of people left. I scared them away. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, a little fluff back here to deal with. Not too, too bad. Uh, nice little bottoming pattern. Uh, who asked about that? Fantastic. Um, yeah, looking good. And you got a little bit of a bow tie working. So, yeah, that's a good-looking stock. Not as good-looking as the one I showed earlier, but darn good-looking. Howard, yes, you're correct. Good job, Howard. I thought you I thought you were following somebody else. Uh, cool, thanks. I uh, wasn't even trying to find it. Yeah, good job. And seeing a lot of oil and gas stocks trying to move higher in my Landry Universe scan. Oh, cool. Thank you, Nate. Now, see, you're doing a lot of work to find those stocks. You should you should be paying me to find those stocks for you. F E Y E for Mr. Phil. F E Y E. Yeah, it's breaking out to brand new highs. Uh, put it on your momentum list. Ooh, look at that. That's a um, that's a um, a Phoenix type of stock. Okay. So, yeah, first pullback on this stock might be worth a shot. I like it. I like it a lot, Phil. Line. You're the man. You're the man, Howard. How can I be the man when you're the man? Very tempted to join the service and get the selection course. Well, Nate, uh, I appreciate that. Feel free to do it. I would like for you to do that. CDE. CDE. Um. You know, here's the thing, uh, if, you know, not the soft sell, but I am anyway. Uh, if you pick, if the stock selection course can stop you from picking a stock that would have turned into a loser, you've paid for it. If the stock selection course can help you pick a winner, then you've paid for it ten times. And if the free service that comes with it helps you to find more and more winners, or at least confirm what you're doing, then, again, that's more than paid for itself, too. So, obviously, I'm a big fan of what I do. You have to be. Otherwise, why would you do it? Uh, no, CDE's got a lot of bad memories and problems uh, on the way back up, as will a lot of these silver stocks. But um, dig around a little bit. You might be able to find something a little bit better. Silver's kind of tough. Gold, silver, I know it sounds crazy. Gold trades slightly cleaner than silver, but not by much. Keg, keg's going to be an energy stock. And it's probably going to look okay. I probably should have dusted off my lander list before getting started. Uh, but, yeah, this looks like a major bottomed type of market. Yeah, this is one of the small, uh, lower price ones I didn't put on the list. But, yeah, I think this one's bottomed out. Um, I think it's worth a shot. Uh, Volatility is pretty high, 161, so be warned. Um, if they don't got a business, go out of business, maybe it could be in like an option that never expires. I shouldn't say that because that goes against everything I say. But, um, you know, just don't bet the form. JJC is copper. JJC, JJC is copper. <clears throat> yeah, I wouldn't say it. this market hasn't turned just yet. You see the moving averages are trying to come together. 
but um, to me, it doesn't look like a market that has turned just yet. But it's it's bottom ing, okay? And ing being the keyword in that sentence. G L U U bowtie momentum and is going up till it doesn't stop at the twenty for Howard. G L U U. Uh, yeah, but that's a force. That's a force bow tie. I don't count that as a bow tie for my patterns because it's forced because it, the gap made it happen. So that's not a tradable pattern. Um, the move happened kind of out of the blue. XCC for Gary. XCC, XCC. Uh, no, it's too wide and loose. I mean, go look at the energies. You know, go back and look at that one we didn't. Look, look at this stock. Okay, it's all over the place. And then take a look at, let me just put it back up and show you what you should be looking for right now. We're almost, we're pretty much out of time, so we'll have to hurry up. Uh, we could find it. It's going to be last slide I get to. You ever notice when you're looking for something, it's always in the last place you look? I guess because after you find it, you stop looking. Where is that stop? Yeah. I mean, look at this one. You know, it's got a nice, oops, you got a nice bottoming formation. You got a very defined bow tie, and you have a little bit, but not too much overhead supply, whereas the chart we were just looking at, if I could find it, you see it's kind of all over the place. So try to find something that's a little bit more cleanly trading. Thank you, Howard. Tanned resistance, level pullback, and break through could be nice. Tan. Yeah, uh, the only problem here is, and this is where the, the overhead supply rears its ugly head, but yeah, these, this uh, tan is solar stocks. It does look good. It is a bow tie off of multi-year lows. It's not going to be all time. Um, I prefer a bow tie back here. If you all remember, like we talked about earlier, that's where, that, that's where the, the inefficient solar stocks came from for uh, my examples. Uh, I hear you. It just has a lot, a lot, a lot of overhead uh, supply to get through. Also, uh, keep it. Watch out. Sometimes these uh, ETFs. Look at the components of an ETF. Sometimes just one or two issues makes up the majority of the ETF. Okay. OAS. Okay. Let me just try to get to one or two people who haven't gotten to them and just shut things down. Yes. Uh, OAS. Yeah, this looks pretty good. Um, you do have a gap to deal with. You do have some overhead supply. But I hear you. This is a lot cleaner than that one we were just looking at. Uh, notice that it, it's, uh, it's got some kind of interesting characteristics because it made these new lows. Then it made a marginal new low. Then it made almost a bow tie. So I think that one is – I think that one's almost worth a shot. I think it's, I think it's a close second to the one that I've got in the, in the thing, okay? Box, do you have a look at the IPO? Yeah, I mean this is um, it to, for my style of trading. It would have to make uh, brand new highs decisively on that one. Okay, we did have a couple of the uh, if you did if you do have the IPO course, go in and look. Um, and I didn't have time to get to them today, but we did have some that took off that are in the portfolio uh, very nicely. So maybe we'll get to those uh, next week or whenever. I got two weeks from now. Well, I'm going to have to go ahead and uh, shut things down just because the recording is getting a little long here. Uh, I appreciate you guys taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I, and as you can tell, I love doing these shows. So thank you so much. You want any, If there's anything you need me to follow up on, shoot me an email. Um, obviously, uh, I'll try to get to you as soon as I can. I'm leaving the country here in a couple days, so I'll be a little behind on emails probably while I'm traveling. And uh, no show next week. But uh, the following week, uh, there's a show. You can still register for that show. If you register for this one, you should be already registered for that. But if not, see the countdown on my website. Anyway, thanks again. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you for your well wishes uh, on my trip. I should have a good time. Get a little business in. Have a little fun. Uh, that's the best type of trip for me to take. Uh, anyway, everyone uh, enjoy themselves. Have a great weekend if we don't talk again. And then I'll see you guys in a couple of weeks. Thank you so much.